thought this morning uh, it, we, we are pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Mark Hilton from Purdue University. Uh, Mark's a clinical professor of beef production medicine at Purdue University. Uh, he has a BS in animal science and a DDM from Purdue. He was a partner and practice owner of an 80% food animal practice in DeWitt, Iowa for 15 years, and in 1996, he became a diplomat of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners in the beef cattle specialty. In 1998, he uh, was recruited to, to Purdue to initiate an elective in beef production and to take veterinary uh, students on food animal ambulatory calls. And Hilton, Hilton also teaches achieving success in practice for the third year veterinary students. He's also one of the authors of Veterinary's Opinion Com and Beef Magazine, and he's received numerous teaching awards, including the SCAB and National Teaching Award in 2000, the Continuing Educator of the Year uh, Medicine Award uh, in 2012. And in 2013, he was named one of the 20 most influential bovine veterinarians in North America by Bovine Veterinary Magazine. With this, I ask you to welcome Dr. Mark Hilton to the podium. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And well, wow, quite humbling to be asked to speak at this meeting, so thanks, thanks to you for, for asking me. So my topic was where have we been, where are we now, and where are we going? I'll try to hit on a few of those topics. Obviously can't cover, cover every, everything on the list. And let's see, got it. So, you know, I think all of us know what bovine respiratory disease. Worldwide concern in the, in the beef and the dairy industry. 70 to 80 percent of all of our morbidity, 40 to 50 percent of all of our mortality, and the NOMS data, which Dave Darg is going to give lots more information on NOMS, shows that we treat 16.2 percent of our calves in the feedlot for BRD. And if I have one word for that, it's unacceptable. Too many. Too many calves we treat. Too many calves die, and that's, that's going to be my focus, is that we can do better. The calves deserve better. We have more information, and we can do a better job. So if, if you get one thing from my take home, that's, that's, what, it, that's what it is. On, a, on the dairy side, thanks to Amelia for some, for some dairy slides, too. I don't do as much dairy work as I used to do when I was in practice. Unweaned heifer calves, or under, under, yeah, unweaned heifers in the, in the uh, dairy operation, the 2002 data shows about 8.7% death loss, and that's due to all causes, and a bit of improvement until 2007. When we look at unwe or weaned heifer calves, really no difference in the five years of the, from the one study to the, to the next. When we look at calves that are weaned, we're, we're looking at about 50% of the death loss is due to BRD, and when I broke that down, oh, excuse me, let's start with unweaned heifer calves. Mostly due to scours and, and diarrhea is where the death loss is on the, on the dairy side. But we're definitely seeing some respiratory. But I wanted to break it down into how many per thousand. So in 02, lost about 19 out of 1,000. And in 2007, really no difference, 18 calves out of 1,000 we lost on the dairy due to BRD on the unweaned. On the weaned side, we made a little bit of progress. Lost about 10 per, per thousand in 02 and 07 shows that we've improved that to losing about seven, seven per thousand on the, uh, on the, on the dairy, dairy side. Oh, those came in backwards. So you know, we know the pathogens. You know, we can sit and argue is coronavirus a big deal or some other bacteria, but really this is, these are the four viruses and bacteria we're, we're talking about. We've been over the risk factors, and I know DL Stepp's going to talk here, and I'm assuming that he's going to talk a bit about their large trial that they did looking at, you know, is weaning the big deal or is vaccination the big deal in these calves? And his study showed, I think, pretty distinctly that it's weaning. That is the biggest stress on this, on this calf. You know, that beef calf's been with mom 24-7 for six to seven months, and it's a huge stress to wean, wean the calf. So that was the, that's the, the big deal. Lack of immunity, surely, you know, some of these calves are from little tiny herds that have never been vaccinated, no even natural exposure to the, the viruses that we typically see. Other herds, you know, are going to have a little bit of natural immunity, but sure could use some vaccine in those, in those calves. Abrupt diet change. The past few years, we haven't seen a high starch diet in our starter calves. Because things like distiller's grain and corn gluten and soy hulls have been a cheaper price 
per pound of energy than corn. But I just did some analysis this year. Corn's our cheapest source of energy right now where I live in, in the Midwest. That's going to be more in our rations this coming year. And again, sets those calves up for a, for a stress having some acidosis. Surgery, castration and dehorning around the time of weaning. You know, come on. You know, we've known for years that's not the right thing to do. Parasite problems when these calves come in gives the immune system another thing to think about rather than BRD. And we need to, we need to have these calves dewormed before they hit the, the feedlot. Mixing a cattle of different environments. You know, I always say, think of your first day at kindergarten or first day, or first grade. A whole bunch of kids from all kinds of places. It's a stressful event mixing those animals together. You've got to get the hierarchy down. You know, it's a stress just mixing these cattle, mixing these cattle together. Dusty conditions, mucociliary apparatus of the trachea is decreased. So again, more likely that the bacteria that are the normal flora of the, of the respiratory, upper respiratory tract, are going to get, get down and cause a, cause a problem. And concurrent diseases in our, in our area, that would be coccidiosis most likely. So if the calf, again, is fighting off some other disease, he has less chance to, to fight off the BRD. And I was at a, a repro talk uh, one time that Brad White gave, and he made a statement that I'll never forget, and I just think it fits so many, so many areas. He said, when we see repro problems in beef herds, it's because of an accumulation of errors. How many times do we see single entity diseases in our business? When I see a cow underneath an oak tree, two, two cows underneath an oak tree that are dead, and we had a lightning storm the night before, that's a single entity disease. It's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's about the only time I see single entity diseases. Things are an accumulation of problems. And if we can eliminate most of these, and that calf has one little problem walking into the feedlot, he's going to laugh at it. So we've got to get these calves more prepared to enter the feedlot. So it's an accumulation of errors that we need to work on. I think this is probably one of the most significant research findings I've read personally in the last few years on BRD. And I'm going to actually read what it, what it says. This is from Timsit, who was at, Dr. Timsit was in France when he did this. He's now at um, Calgary in Canada. But, he, but they did DNA testing on calves as they walked into the feedlot. The significant within pin diversity of Mannheim hemolytica during BRD episodes indicates that the disease is not primarily due to the spread of a single virulent clone among cattle and highlights the importance of predisposing factors that enable the resident flora to over overcome the calf's immune system. So in other words, we used to say, oh, it was that one calf that spread the bacteria all around to the other calves and got them all sick. Wrong. It's the calf's own bacteria that are in his upper respiratory system Manheimia and Jared Taylor, I talked to from Oklahoma State, said we're finding the same thing with pasturella. So don't blame it on the other calf. It's that calf itself which makes it more important that we get that calf ready for the feedlot. Stop blaming, you know, that group of cheap calves that you bought for causing all the disease. Sure, they're going to spread virus around. We know that. But the bacteria pretty much is the calf's own bacteria that he started with. So if we can help him to not have a stressful event, not have those bacteria head down into the lung, we're halfway home. And I just, I just thought it was a wonderful piece of research. What's the reality? I think progress was part of my title. And 10.3 to 14.2 to 16% is not progress. We're going backwards. Have we had advancements in vaccines and bacterins? Nutrition, ancillary treatments, which questionable whether that's a benefit. Antibiotics. Who, may, who says we've had advancements in those after, over the last 20 years? Yeah, but the numbers are telling us we're going the wrong way. So that's not the answer, folks. A brand new antibiotic is not the, is not the answer. Mortality, 2013, we fed about 25 million cattle in the U.S., 1.6% loss. And if 45% were due to BRD, 181,000 head of cattle. Are they valuable today? Wouldn't you like to have a few of those 181,000 cattle to give the consumer some more beef? I would. We can do better. So why are we having more problems? Younger calves entering the feedlot. Our genetics have improved tremendously. We're weaning 
600 pound calves now instead of 400 pound calves back when I was a kid. You know, I looked at our records back when I was a kid. We weaned a lot of calves that weighed between three and 400 pounds. Six months old. We're weaning 700 pound calves now sometimes. So we got younger calves with poor immunity entering the, entering the feedlot. Larger pens of cattle. You know, we've got huge, huge lots where the mixing and the, and the, the social event of that calf is more stressful to the calf. More cattle moving through multiple marketing cha channels. Sometimes these cattle have three and four homes before they finally go to, go to slaughter. So another chance to have another, another stressful event with moving and mixing with other cattle. More viral exposure, more social interaction of the cattle that's a negative for, for them. Uh, record high prices for cattle. I mean, I was sitting at breakfast this morning and talking to some um, veterinary practitioners that I think all own their own cattle, and every one of them, without question, said, this is unbelievable, isn't it? You know, I was just over in Australia. Their, their prices are half what our prices are, half. We are in some awesome times, and I think the temptation this fall is going to be to take calves and not background them, not precondition them, send them right to the yard, take the money and run. And I'm going to hopefully show you that that's absolutely the wrong thing to do this year. As I was doing the uh, talk, I actually used this quote when I talked to our veterinary students. This is from Vet Clinics of North America, from Tom Edwards, and I just think it's fabulous. It's highly unlikely that control of BRD in the feedlot can be accomplished through an on-arrival vaccination program. Tom's a lot smarter than I am and seen a lot more cattle, so we've got to get the calf ahead of time. So metaphylaxis was invented about, what, 30 years ago here in the U.S.? Phenomenal. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the data is rock solid on this. There is, you can't find somebody that's going to stand up at a meeting or a research that says, boy, here's something that's not worthwhile, spending 15 bucks on a calf that's worth, what, $1,200 and decreasing BRD. Fabulous. But is this the best we've got? You know, I just, absolutely not. Absolutely not. What if McDonald's says no? What if tomorrow McDonald's Corporation says we are not going to buy cattle that had metaphylaxis because we think that that's not the best thing to do? Would our industry change in a day? You know, um, Ray Stegman and I were talking about pork quality assurance this morning and how that changed the pork industry. What if Walmart says no? Okay, I think we need to think about these things. Um, again, Dave Dargis is going to talk a lot about the NOM study, but when they were asked, which of the following, they said to the feedlot guys, which of the following would you like to have done before these cattle hit, hit the, uh, the feedlot? And lots of the normal pre-processing topics that we always talk about, 81.5% of feedlot guys say, yeah, I want those things done, vaccinated, weaned, th things like that. 81.5% of feedlots wanted that done. When they said, do you want the information, 70% said, yeah, I want to know what that calf's had before he hits my feedlot. But the reality is we're giving it to him about a third of the time. That calf, we need more information going with that calf. How many unnecessary vaccinations do we get, give to calves? I read one time where the average calf has three or four black leg vaccinations in its lifetime. You know, ridiculous. That's, we can do better than that. The calf deserves better. Uh, disconnect with nearly 70% wanting the in, inf information on these calves. Anybody that knows me knows that this is one of my favorite topics. You know, I've written about it in Beef Magazine. I've gotten a little heat from some producers that say, I just can't do it, cannot do it, Doc. We can't do it at our, our place. But weaned 45 days, vaccinated, parasite control, all surgeries done, trained to eat from the bunk, drink from a tank. Again, numerous studies show these calves get sick less. If the feedlot is buying all preconditioned calves, the percent morbidity and mortality decreases dramatically. Well, sure, we've all heard the studies, too, or the stories, too, of the guy that buys a 1,000 head of calves, only got 900 head, you know, of those high-risk calves bought, and what, for whatever reason bought 100 preconditioned calves, and they got just as sick. Well, no kidding, you know? There's a little bit of a stress in those, in those calves, a little virus exposure, et cetera. But I think... Extremely important to talk more about preconditioning. A 50-year history on this. 
You know, it reminds me of us talking about hybrid vigor in the cow-calf operation. The first research was done about mm, 85 years ago that says we need hybrid vigor in the cow-calf industry, and we still are talking about that. It's crazy, you know, some things we just don't get. But some of the first studies did a poor job on this. Poor average daily gain. Some of the first studies that I pulled out, these calves were gaining one-half to one pound per head per day. And as my dad would say, gosh, a good feeder lamb would do that. You know, you want to tick off beef guys? Compare them to the sheep industry. You know, that, that doesn't make people happy. High morbidity. So, some of these studies, 30% of the calves they treated. We did a study on one of our farms in Indiana. I have 11 years of data on this farm. He treated one calf out of almost 1,100 head, one calf for BRD over 11 years. He had three calves die in that time, so 1,100 calves fed, he lost three. One due to an accident, one due to bloat, and one due to BRD. So we treated one calf with BRD and we lost one calf. I mean, how many of you have cow-calf producers that background their own calves and never see BRD in those calves? Hands. Yeah, happens all the time. So getting them ready on the, on the farm. Of, so morbidity, when you're preconditioning, it shouldn't, shouldn't be the case. Many of the studies only examine the preconditioning bonus. How many of you have had clients that have said, yep, preconditioned my calves, took them to market, they brought the exact same as the neighbors that they didn't do anything? How many? Yeah, well, what if their genetics were not very good? You know? Ask your clients. You, you want to have some fun? Ask your clients on a scale of 0 to 10, how do their genetics compare to the average herd? You'll have zero herds that say under 5. Everybody's genetics are above average. It's hilarious. You know, maybe this guy took three, you know, his preconditioned calves sold in groups of three, and the neighbor took 80 head of nice uniform calves. So there's lots of other reasons. Forget the dang bonus. We have no control over that. Worry about weight gain. That's where you make money preconditioning. In our study, 63% of the, the income that he made with preconditioning was due to weight gain. Only 34% was due to the bonus that he got. So, okay, here's how to stop having high-risk calves go to the market and impact the market in, uh, in six months. So we get every buyer of feedlot calves together, and all of them promise, they raise their right hand, and they promise that they're going to pay half price for high-risk calves. So instead of $240, they'll bring $1.20. All right? In six months, we're not going to have any more high-risk calves. Or here's how we do it in one month. Okay? We don't buy any. All of the buyers, all, all of your guys, everybody that's buying feeder calves gets together and for one month says, we're not going to bid on high-risk calves. We're going to let them come to the market, and the price is going to get down to $5 a hundred, and nobody's going to buy them, and the owner has to take them back home. Think that it'll change in a month? Yeah, I think so. Well, that ain't going to happen, so forget that. 2008 data showed that a third of our calves were weaned for more than 30, 32 days before they went to market. Again, the calf deserves better than that. We know how to do a better job. Here's, here's our study that we did on the, on the preconditioning. His net return to labor and management was $80.70 per calf for feeding that calf for 56 days. The herd that did this had had a financial analysis done um, by Harlan, Harlan Hughes, the year before, his net profit per cow per year was 20 bucks. And he said to me, he says, now let me get this straight. I own the beef cow for 365 days and I make a $20 bill. I own the calf for 56 days and I make 80 bucks. He goes, what's wrong with this, this picture? Why isn't everybody doing this? And I said, because it's different and it's hard and, you know, people just haven't put the, put the pencil put the pencil to it. So I'm going to get on my soapbox again. Stop talking about the dang bonus. We have no control over the preconditioning bonus. We have control over the weight gain. I threw this together in about 15 minutes, put a ration together on, on preconditioned calves, and it's going to be in the next Beef Magazine article. For this year's calves, should they hold the calves or not, bottom line is a profit of $115 for preconditioning your calves this year for 60 days. You want to add a little bit, and that's a um, feed efficiency of 5.6 to 1. Want to make a little more money? Implant the calf. Think about the decreased shrink in a preconditioned calf 
and add some more dollars. So 160 bucks. You know, it's not the year to take the money and run. Cow-calf guys are making a really nice profit this year, but this is the year to hold those calves, put some more weight on them, send a healthier calf to the, to the feedlot, and everybody's happy. So how to decrease BRD incidence? Questionable impact. New vaccines to be given on arrival at the feedlot and new antibiotics to give at metaphylaxis. It's not gonna, that's not going to do it. I appreciate the drug companies, the pharmaceutical companies, for all they've done. It's fabulous. I have a tool chest that I could have not dreamed about when I graduated 31 years ago. But that's not the answer. Potential impact. Increased study of micronutrients. And the reason this slide's different in the background, Bob Sager from Montana sent me this beautiful picture. Uh, yeah, this is not West Lafayette, Indiana, for those of you that, <laughs> you know, didn't go to Purdue. <laughs> yeah. So... The, the, the hill means, you know, in, in the road where, you, where, you know, the, the water won't quite stand on the thing. But Bob had a um, cow-calf producer. In fact, he had numerous cow-calf producers that had large ranches that did everything right, got the calves vaccinated, did everything right, and they still broke with BRD in the feedlot. And he said, this isn't right. And, you know, I'm going to say, too, most innovation happens at the, at the practitioner level. Practitioners are so valuable in trying to figure out what's going on and be questionable of what's going on. Us in the university, we, we're so dependent on you to give us ideas on what to do. But he looked at cobalt and said, this is a cobalt deficient area. I think this is a big deal. So he did a master's and a Ph.D. at like 65 years old, I think, and said, this is a big deal, and did a research project and showed a significant increase in humoral immunity to uh, Mannheimian hemolytica when they supplemented the calves with, with cobalt. So some of these calves where you're doing everything right, call somebody smart like Chris Chase and say, I need some help on this. This is not right. So awesome. Improve pre-winning nutrition of calves. You know, milk production is going down. Grass quality is going down. Sometimes we've got these high growth, tremendous genetic calves that they're energy deficient, protein deficient when we're weaning them. How can we expect their immune system to fire properly if we don't have the proper nutrition? Some of these calves need some feed before they get weaned. You know, better pasture, something to help nutrition. Fetal programming, huge area of research on, you know, can we change some things on that cow that's going to impact that calf for life? You know, it's, it's exciting to me. Develop new BRD vaccines to be given well ahead of weaning potential help. Discover genetic components, and I think somebody is going to talk about that. Meat Animal Research Center is doing some wonderful studies, studies on that. Likely impact. Improve the immunity of the calf before it arrives at the feedlot. I've talked about that over and over. Decrease or increase the age of the calf going into the feed yard. 60 days of preconditioning means that calf's 60 days older. His immune system 60 days older. I think that's important. Feeding more calves at home. You know, the local thing is huge around our area. You know, again, I just came back from Australia. Same thing. Really big. You know, maybe some of your clients can feed their own calves and niche market those cattle and get some more, more money for them. We know feeding your own calves at home decreases BRD tremendously. So fewer high-risk calves. I've talked about that ad nauseum. All surgeries ahead of time. We don't discount bulls nearly enough. Demand by the retailers. Again, if McDonald's and Walmart tomorrow say... Nope, we're not, we're not buying calves unless they were preconditioned. Our industry will change overnight, and that will make a, that will make a huge impact. Uh, another quote by a, a smart, smart veterinarian, Del Miles, perhaps it's time to look to the industry for more ways to reduce death loss by methods that focus on the animal's response to the pathogen instead of continuing to focus on the pathogens. What's the animal's response? Written in 2009 and just as, just as important for today. So, in summary, many advances. None of us, you all raised your hand when I said, you know, have we had advances. We still treat too many cattle. Who among, who among us can defend the practice of weaning the beef calf from his mom, sticking him on a truck, trucking him miles away, putting him with a whole bunch of new calves, putting a new feed in front of his, his face that he's never seen before? I can't defend the practice. We have to focus on preparing the calf for the feedlot well ahead of time, Educate the clients that it's the pounds that pay. Thank you very much.